Um, so in thinking about uh, capitalism and the human, for me, the kind of necessary uh, mediating term, at least in a sort of Marxist lens, is to think the question of capitalism, the human, and labor or work. Um, and of course, in the long history of, of Marxism, that conjunction has had multiple different meanings. There's a sense, you know, often associated with the uh, early Marx of 1844, that what capitalism does is uh, exploit some unique human capacity to labor, that very capacity that sets us apart from the beavers and the bees, um, and because of that it alienates us from our essence, and then there's maybe another view associated more often with, with capital and later Marx, the sense that it's not so much that capitalism alienates us from this common humanity, but it constitutes, through reducing us to our labor power, a new sort of common essence that it produces rather than exploits. I'm gonna to touch on those debates, but I don't really wanna go into them directly. In fact, what I want to do, and hopefully not to complicate things too much, in thinking capitalism, the human work, I also want to connect this to the, the question of the politics of that connection. And here I'm prompted by a, a rather strange and striking formulation that Marx offers uh, in Capital Volume 3. Um, so uh, bear me with, with me, this is a long passage. Uh, Marx writes, the specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of the direct producers determines the relationship of domination and servitude as this grows directly out of production itself and reacts back on it in turn as a determinant. It is in each case the direct relationship of the owners of production to the immediate producers, a relationship whose particular form naturally corresponds always to a certain level of development of the type and manner of labor and hence to its social productive power in which we find the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social edifice and hence also the political form of the relationship of sovereignty and dependence, in short, the specific form of the state in each case. And I find this to be a rather provocative, as I've said, and very different formulation of the relationship between sort of capital and politics than the sort of more famous formulations of base and superstructure, but it's also a very questionable one. How can the specific form of labor or work play this determining role when, as we all know, work varies in multiple different senses. There are multiple different types of work and engagements of work, both you know, globally and nationally in, in, every, in a specific workplace. So in kind of orienting this, um, I'm gonna, and hopefully this is not, this is very sort of foundational. This is part of the foundational argument of a, of a book I have coming out. Hopefully this doesn't sound too pedantic. So I wanna think about um, the labor relation in terms of its structuring conditions and how that ties to both the, the question of, of human commonality and human difference and politics. So at first glance, labor is like any other commodity. It has a price, it's wage, uh, it's wage established like the price of any other commodity according to the dictates of supply and demand and so on and so forth. Um, and this appearance of labor as another commodity has both, I think from Marx, a material and an ideological dimension. As Marx writes, quote, all the notions of justice held by both the worker and the capitalist, all the mystifications of the capitalist mode of production, all of capitalism's illusions about freedom, all the apologetic tricks of vulgar economics have as their basis in the form of appearance discussed above, which makes the actual relation invisible and indeed presents to the eye the precise opposite of that relation. So in some sense, the wage is the spontaneous ideology of capitalism. It presents work as, as something like all other commodities, it's paid for at its few value, and to some extent it obscures, I mean this is one of the things that Marx is very obsessed with, the way in which exploitation in capitalism is, is obscured by the wage relation itself. There is no point at which one, as sort of in a feudal system, sees the difference between their own productive uh, activity uh, reinforcing their own existence and their productive activity as, it, as it, it, it creates wealth for another. So there is a sort of recognition in the wage that uh, 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 makes possible a kind of ideological identification with capital. And, um, 
And also, of course, the wage. I mean, the other thing that, of course, feminist critics would point out, the wage also obscures the non-wage work that makes wage work possible. So the wage obscures exploitation and provides a basis for recognition or interpolation of the worker. Um, but of course, that's not the entirety of the labor relation. Um, as much as uh, capital or the, the wage functions to make uh, uh, labor power like any other commodity, labor power is also irreducibly not like every other commodity. As Marx also writes, sort of underscoring some of that conflict. Uh, and here I think it's interesting that Marx phrases his conflict in terms of both the way in which the capital relation is like any other market relation, but also in that identity there is an irreducible difference. As Marx says, the capitalist maintains his right as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible, and where it's possible to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the peculiar nature of the commodity sold implies a limit to its consumption by the purchaser, and the worker maintains his right as a seller when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length. There is therefore an antinomy of right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange between equal rights, force decides. So these two sides of the equation, the wage as interpolating uh, labor as, as adequately paid for, and the site of work itself, the site of its exploitation, where the worker is trying to struggle to maintain their very existence, their very bodily integrity, produce a kind of split. Uh, as uh, Pierre Macheret writes, Quote, the condition for the wage system to produce all of its effects is therefore that the worker has been put in the position of a divided subject. Remaining entirely master of his labor power, he has alienated only its use, which supposes that this force can be materially separated from its use. The seller of labor can identify with his exchange, seeing him or herself as the owner of a valuable commodity that can be leveraged to produce other commodities or identify with its use, in which he, uh, or or, sorry, or can identify with its use in which he or she is subject to the will and control of another. The exchange of labor power is the basis of both ideological identification and alienation. It is the contradictory unity of both. Moving beyond expanding upon this contradiction between identification and alienation, recognition and exploitation means moving into the hidden abode of production. Um, oops, page is out of order the uh, labor process itself. Of course, the speci specificity of the labor process and the history of changing working conditions makes it difficult to say anything about work in general. Uh, but here we take taking a clue from Marx again. Uh, he offers two, I think, fundamental categories to think about the labor relation, and that is abstract labor and concrete labor. And these two concepts are kind of introduced first, of course, to explain what Marx was trying to explain in the first volume of Capital at the very beginning, the possibility of exchange of value itself, but uh, I think they have a heuristic role beyond that. And of course, Marx repeatedly stresses that he did not discover uh, the connection between labor and value, that he credits that to Smith and Ricardo and so on, but that the dual nature of labor, abstract and concrete, is, to quote Marx, the secret of the whole critical conception. And I would add to that, if the capitalist mode of production is understood not just as the production of things, of commodities, but as a production of capitalism itself, of social relations, then abstract and concrete labor cannot be separated from their effects on subjectivity. Viewing these two types or two sides of labor, not from the side of the commodity or the relation to value, they can be identified with two different aspects of the labor process. Concrete labor corresponds to the qualitative aspect, the actual task with the specific demands and constraints the specific work of tailoring, weaving, waiting on tables, etc., while abstract labor corresponds to less to the particular conditions of this or that job than the general conditions of labor itself, especially as labor is related to quantifiable demands of productivity. These two sides, intertwined and inseparable in their actual labor process, no concrete labor is done outside of the general conditions of abstract labor, and abstract labor cannot be done without the specific work of producing specific things, also constitute two poles for understanding its experience. Concrete labor is the basis of much of what we discuss when we discuss the experience of work, defining in some sense it, its constraints and con conditions, the frustrations and joys of the workday. It is a specific challenge of doing a particular job. At first glance, it would appear that abstract labor is outside the immediate experience of work, and Marx often refers to it as going on behind the back of producers. Uh, uh, but as much as the individual as an individual 
uh, focuses on their particular labor, the task of their job, and its particular constraints and conditions, this labor is part of a process and necessarily exceeds their understanding and awareness. But despite this, uh, uh, the demands to be productive uh, to, or produce at a, at a set quantifiable standard are as integral to the working experience as the specific experience of what one is doing. Or, or we might say what constitutes the experience of work is to be found in the intersection and contradictions of concrete and abstract labor. That is in the intersection of concrete task and abstract imperatives. The identity or non-identity of these two aspects makes up the experience of work. Um, or as uh, Isabel Garreau writes, uh, quote, the originality of Marx's approach lies in the dialectical nature of this his analysis of contradictions, which is not the mere juxtaposition of opposing tendencies. The capitalist labor process is not on the one hand alienating, on the other hand emancipating. It closely intertwines these two tendencies at the very center of individuality of the worker and at the heart of the social relation. Or we might say what constitutes the experience of work is to be found in the intersection and contradictions of concrete and abstract labor. That is the intersection of the concrete task and its general imperatives. Um, and so these two, uh, different aspects can in turn be considered in terms of how they function as both the basis of both an identification as an alienation. Um, to some extent, uh, for example, uh, the, the identification side of concrete labor is of course everything we think about of a specific work ethic, specific pride of doing a specific job, the satisfaction one might find with that, the way that you know a teacher wants to teach a good class, uh, or a chef wants to make a good meal, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, that aspect is uh, uh, constantly being threatened by uh, a capitalist process which has no interest in those sort of moments of pleasure and possibility. And thus it forces us to think about the way in which uh, uh, there might be you know, a, a kind of identification with abstract labor, which seems strange to think, because how can one identify with work in the generic? But I think there are, uh, uh, to some extent, you know, uh, this is what Hegel thought about work in the philosophy of right in the sense that there is a social standing which just comes from having a job, from having a place in, no matter what the job is, there is a certain sense of, you know, as work sands off particularity, it also gives one social standing so one can think about an identification with the abstract category of work itself. Um, so, uh, and going, moving beyond that, um, uh, in Marx, there is a sense in which Marx's identification of the sort of, we might want to call the political or cultural dimensions of abstract labor, take on a very peculiar um, and, and in some sense uh, ill-fated uh, uh, trajectory. That Marx uh, associated abstract labor not only with the economic imperative to render all labor interchangeable, but also with a general shift of cultural and political values. The interchangeability of the labor of different individuals in the factory necessarily has effects that exceed it. Uh, as Marx writes in the Manifesto, differences of age and sex no longer have any distinctive social validity for the working class. The use of labor power in the abstract creates the ideal of abstract humanity, uh, uh, and as Marx uh, indicates in Capital, the effect of this transformation extends well beyond the restricted demand of the economy um, to encompass a kind of transformation of cultural and even religious values, as Marx writes in the strange passage in Capital One. For a society of commodity producers whose general social relations of production consist in the fact they treat their products as commodities, hence as values, and in its material form bring their individual private labors into relation with each other as homogeneous human labor, Christianity, with its religious cult of man in the abstract, more particularly in its bourgeois development, in Protestantism, deism, etc., is the most fitting form of religion. Abstract labor short circuits the divide between the worldly concerns of the economy and the lofty ideals of religion, uh, cutting through the levels of superstructure. Abstract labor, and with it abstract humanity, is in some sense a real abstraction on this reading. Um, and this is, ties in with Marx's understanding of capital itself as the disruptive force and all that solid melts into air and so on around this idea of an abstract uh, uh, and interchangeable humanity. At the same time, so I, now talking about the way in which both concrete and abstract labor can be sites of identification, I want to talk about them as sites also of alienation and the specific form of alienation that they entail. Uh, as much as abstract labor can be considered an ethic and a basis for recognition, uh, it can be grasped in terms of its inherent negativity. 
Um, the norm of productivity is not only indifferent to differences, as Marx would claim, or we're going to examine that, of gender, age, and ethnicity, a uh, divide hu humanity, it is also indifferent to the very limitations of humanity as a living thing. As Marx writes in the Grundriss, contrasting the pre-capitalist world with capitalism, Quote, thus the old view in which the human being appears as the aim of production, regardless of his limited national, religious, political character, seems to be lofty when contrasted with a modern world where production appears as the aim of all mankind and wealth as the aim of production. In bourgeois economics, and the epoch of production to which it corresponds, this complete working out of the human content appears as a complete emptying out. These, this universal objectification is total alienation and the tearing down of all limited one-sided aims as a sacrifice of the human end in itself to entirely external ends. This is a different sense of alienation than what Marx famously wrote about in the 1844 manuscripts, not an alienation from the specific activity of one's labor, but absolute productivity as alienation from the necessary finite and limited nature of being a specific human being. Productivity itself is an alienation from labor, from labor understood as a necessarily concrete and finite activity. Um, and you know, Marx sees capital, uh, you know, capital sees food, sleep, and the bodies it needs, not as me, uh, facts of finite existence, but as barriers to be overcome through new technologies and inventions, from the lights that keep the uh, factories running, to the emails and texts that extend the time of the office to 24 hours. Um, and even, you know, if you're a Silicon Valley person, attempts to eliminate sleep and to eliminate meals with highly nutritious shakes that will make it possible to be, to, to really be the abstract productivity one is supposed to be. Um, so if the alienation of abstract labor was that of a demanding and infinite productivity, then the alienation of concrete labor is that of a finitude or of an individual reduced to one task, one ability, one skill. Whereas the former holds the concrete individual to an abstract ideal that no one can aspire to, to the demand of productivity that exceeds the limitation of the individual who still needs to eat, sleep, etc. The latter reduces the individual to less than what they are capable of becoming just that particular job, losing their human indeterminacy and their human possibility. Uh, if, lab, if abstract labor is in some sense the embodiment of the imperative of productivity, then concrete labor is the hierarchy of the different labors made flesh as differences of jobs become differences between bodies and the hierarchy of labor becomes a hierarchy of individuals. Um, as Etienne Balibar writes, quote, this process modifies the status of the human body, the human status of the body. It creates body men men whose body is a machine body that is fragmented and dominated and is used to perform one isolatable function or gesture being both destroyed in its integrity and fetishized, atrophied, and hypertrophied in its useful organs. Um, and of course, the persistence of body men also means there are, there are eggheads, pencil necks, mind men, that the entire sort of uh, uh, corpus of, of, of the human being is kind of reduced to whatever organ is necessary for whatever specific job. And of course, this extends beyond wage labor to, to unwage reproduction as well. Um, uh, the finitude of being this particular body with its history and relations is then overlaid with a secondary finitude that ties particular individuals to a particular jobs and a particular place in society. It is the ability to look at an individual reduced to doing a particular repetitive, boring, or stressful job and see not the alienation of human potential, but its realization, to believe that this is what this person is meant to be doing. It is precisely because of the anarchy of the social division of labor, the fact that no one is born into a particular job or task, that the existing division of labor in society seems so natural. It's because no one was ever made to do anything forced by the state that everyone appears to be doing what they were made to do. It is because capitalism is predicated on abstract labor on the different indifferent exploitation of human potential as potential that differences and hierarchies of the exploitation labor appear naturalized as differences of potentials and possibilities. So the concluding section, the politics of human nature. Um, so on a social scale, these two sides, the abstract and, 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 and the concrete, reinforce each other. Um, the capital engages with human potential as potential would appear to be the justification of every existing hierarchy. Uh, 
and a similar tendency perhaps reinforces their identifications. The identifications of one's particular job and activity functions as a justification of the work itself as the basis of identity and vice versa. However, each specific labor process, even in each particular day at the job, these different identifications and alienations vacillate as one alternately feels the constraint of abstract labor, the demand to be productive, and the limitations of concrete labor, the reduction to a specific task. At the same time, one vacillates between the identification with the ethic and ideal of particular work and the identification with the abstract norm of being a productive member of society. It is possible to examine every laboring situation in terms of both the concrete and abstract labor it's, and on top of that, the way in which concrete and abstract labor are both can be seen as basis for identification and basis for alienation. But returning to the passage that opened this paper, that on labor as the hidden basis of the entire social edifice and hence the political form of the relationship of sovereignty and the state, we can argue that the structural conditions of labor stem from its ability to incorporate the entirety of human nature from its undetermined potential to take on new task and skills to its finite existence as a specific individuality. If, as Andre Tossel argues, every existing society, every mode of production, must in some sense wrestle with both humanity's finitude, not just in the sense of death, but the finitude that restricts us to this life, these skills and knowledges, these possibilities realized, an infinitude, that undetermined capacity that Marx called species being, then it's possible to argue that in capital, it is labor that integrates both sides. Labor is both the zenus of our capacities and the nadir of our limitations. This has to be understood as a particular apparatus of capture in at least two sense senses. First, it captures the very possibility of action becoming the model and ideal of every action, becoming an image of thought and a basis for action. As Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari write, quote, Impose the work model upon every activity. Translate every act into possible or virtual work, discipline, free action, or else, which amounts to the same thing. Relegate it to leisure, which exists only in reference to work. We now understand why the work model in both its physical and social aspects is the fundamental part of the state apparatus." End quote. Or on a, uh, for a mon more mundane example, work, a new job, a better job, working harder rather than political or collective organization becomes the solution to every problem. Uh, in the past few decades, as working conditions and, and wages deteriorate, the response, at least by many, has been to add a second job or gig work, responding to deteriorating working conditions uh, through working more, solving the crisis of work with more work. I mean, you know, to reference other things I talk about in the book, in our society, to break bad is always still just to find a different job and to be really good at that job and solve your problems by that. Um, the capture which is made possible by another capture, a capture of the very I image or ideal of humanity, Marx argued that capital tore aside all of the hierarchies and divisions of humanity, replacing them in the ideal of abstract and different homo laborans, the anthropological substrate of labor power. On this point, it is possible to say that Marx was too optimistic about capital's ten, uh, capacity to remake humanity in its universal image. And this, of course, is you know, what so many have written about for, dec for, for over a century now. Uh, capital did not dispense with the hierarchies of gender, nation, and race, but imposed the work model upon them, reinscribing the hierarchy of humanity in terms of the hierarchy of concrete labor, including, most importantly, the distinction between the labor that is recognized by the wage and the, lab and the necessary labor excluded from the wage form. Uh, uh, so then to think now about what might be at stake in this hidden basis of the social edifice, we can argue that the current form of sovereignty and dependence construct their hierarchies on the terrain of work itself, as it is work that both unifies and divides, unifying on a model of individual discipline and productivity, while at the same time constructing exclusions and hierarchies on the basis of work, dividing between those who work and do not, those who do real work and those who do not. Work is no longer just the basis of society. It is also its superstructure, its economy, its ethics, and its anthropology. Thank you.